So my part of this for today is um, talking about the physical therapy standards of care that you heard a little bit about from what Dr. Finkel said um, this morning when he was going over the care guidelines. Um, I don't have any disclosures to discuss. So what is the standard of care? So as Dr. Finkel said, the standard of care was first done in 2007, and then they were redone in 2017 and published in 2018. I'm going to look just at the physical therapy part. As you saw, there were nine total categories. Um, so they were placed, from the PT perspective, they were placed in three categories. So there was the non-sitter group, the sitter group, and then the ambulant group. Um, and the therapist who put these considerations together discussed postural control, scoliosis, hip deformities, chest deformities, sitting tolerance, contractures, muscle weakness, and mobility. Um, they also talked about in the considerations um, which functional assessments to use for the groups and their bottom overall message in the, in the care considerations when you read the, the part in the paper is being proactive with the use of, of physical therapy. Um, so I kind of just, they're broken down. It's a very detailed tables in the considerations, so that's a good resource to use for your therapist back home or maybe, um, you know, your there's talking about braces in there, so maybe for your orthotist or other care providers that are taking care of the children, you know, closer to home if you're not coming to a care center. Um, so the primary goal for the non-sitter group is to optimize function, minimize the impairments, and optimize the tolerance to various positions. So these typically are, you know, younger children or younger you know, people, obviously there are some non-sitters who are adults. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much experience with that because we only see children up to 18 and at the very most 21. And then by Florida law, you have to go to an adult provider. So we don't really access um, those patients. Um, so it talks about bracing here. So the guideline rec recommends for, you know, the people in this group more than 60 minutes to overnight to be effective in a minimum of five days a week. So you can see that's a lot um, of time in your braces to help prevent, you know, contractures. Um, stretching is three to five time week at a minimum. Strengthening, when we talk about anti-gravity movements, um, so the things that are against gravity, so lifting, not if you were laying down, not on the surface, not moving your arm or your leg in the surface, but lifting off the surface. Um, and then using assistive devices to help. So if you're looking around, uh, if you saw Asher at some point walking his little loft strand crutches, so do you use crutches, do you use AFOs, do you use some of the kids you may see in here with braces for their chest, the TLSO. So using those types of devices to help them be able to achieve higher levels of function. Um, and then positioning, so adaptive strollers, power wheelchairs, adaptive seating systems. So there are various options out there. We could have a whole discussion just on that. Um, so using a provider, if your therapist isn't comfortable, we have someone at our center who does it. I am very lucky I don't have to know it all because she knows almost all of it. Um, but providing them their way to you know to move in their environment is very important so these are the highlights of the non-sitter group and then there's the sitter group um, so the primary goal is to prevent contractors and scoliosis um, and to and to maintain restore promote function or mobility so you can see the goals are a little bit different based on your level of function Again, bracing, more than 60 minutes to overnight and a minimum, again, of five times a week. One difference, if you notice here, looking at the stretching, the stretching in the last group was a minimum of five, to seven, of five days. This is talking about five to seven days. The reason that is, is typically in this group, when you sit in one position all day, think about it as, you know, none of us sit really in one position all day long. We're up, we're down, we're moving. 
but if you're not you know walking and you're in your wheelchair a lot of these kids don't change positions so you tend to get tighter faster so the reason stretching is much more uh, I guess there's more emphasis on the stretching and this is because of that um, and again it talks about getting up in a stander or in a standing position for 60 minutes 60 minutes with a minimum frequency of three to five days a week obviously the optimum is five to seven days a week so again that allows them to change positions to stretch their legs out to do some weight bearing which is healthy for your bones which you heard dr finkel talk about one of the sections in here was about bone health um, so those types of activities which are beneficial to the children or in the adults in different ways um, so for strengthening looking at swimming hippotherapy the possibility of wheelchair sports that are out there um, we have patients who use all of these we have some who play wheelchair soccer I have a patient who plays wheelchair football um, so there are there are activities out there for those types of things and just knowing who to get into contact with and um, you know trying those you know those activities if the children are interested um, again positioning so lightweight manual wheelchairs to promote self propulsion and power wheelchairs if you've seen some of the individuals in here a lot of them are pushing their chairs and that's good because we want them to use their muscles but they're built differently than say a standard wheelchair they're not as heavy so they're allowed to do that um, there are things called power assists which are kind of like a an electric wheel that you can stick on the back of your chair that has a little brace to your wrist you tap the bracelet on your wrist it taps on the power source on the chair and you can kind of give yourself one push and then the wheel kind of pushes you for a longer time so you don't have to use as much energy because we know fatigue can be uh, an issue with some of these so that's another option that's out there for some of these wheelchairs and then obviously we want them to be as independent as we can so some of them are in power wheelchairs and they can drive themselves around um, so for the ambulant group the primary goals um, are to maintain restore promote function and mobility and to a, an adequate joint range of motion and improve balance and endurance so again you can see the, the goals are slightly different from the other two groups bracing in this group is very different we're not talking about minimum wearing them so many nights and so many things this is more to promote posture and function as you can see um, and strengthening so here you look at strength you know stretching we'll do stretching first is two to three weeks a minimum of three to five weeks well that's very different than the last group who was five to you know five days a week and then optimum five to seven days a week so because these patients are moving a little bit more and are are walking they don't tend to get as tight um, then you go into strengthening so we're looking at aerobic and general conditioning so you know including various options such as swimming walking cycling yoga hippotherapy rolling using an elliptical they do talk about you know having a physical therapist or an occupational therapist guiding these treatments at least initially to give you the ideas and then maybe periodically checking back in with them when things are getting easier and you're ready to advance to the next stage you're not just staying where you are you're progressing or if things are getting easier um, they also recommend some form of balance exercises because with our ambulant patients as they fatigue falling is um, can be an issue or at points and so we want to make sure that they're practicing balance exercises which are different than some of the general conditioning and aerobic exercises so again having a therapist to periodically check in with or someone say you go to a gym a personal trainer or someone to have to, to help you out um, if needed this group also can use manual wheelchairs or scooters for longer distances um, to again because fatigue can be an issue so this just gives them another option if they're going somewhere long distance that they can have so that they don't have to feel um, like you're gonna fatigue or take as many rest breaks 
Um, so what the big factor from the PT you know, side of things in the care considerations is optimizing your function. And that's different for everybody. So it, as it says here, it depends on the type of you know, where you are in your, you know, the type of SMA you have and where you are in your functional abilities in that current period of time. Um, so maybe right now you're working on rolling over or sitting up, but in the future you might be working on standing up. So those things are going to change. And so you need to, so your, your expectations and the therapy you receive and what you want to do are going to change based on where you are functionally at that point in time. And what, what are your goals? Because your goals as patients may be very different than my goals as a therapist. And it's my job to work on what you want to do to make things function. You know, if you have no interest in sitting up and all I want you to do is sit up, we're not going to get along very well. So we, you know, my job is to do, and so it's your job as families and patients to tell your therapist, well, I want to really do this. And I really want to work on this. And it's their job then to figure out ways to make that happen for you. That's what our job is as therapists. Um, again, it talks about the need to work with an experienced therapist, either PT or OT, to develop the correct plan. And that plan will need to be updated because our patients change and your goals change. And as you get older and you do different things, then your therapy has to change as well. Again, it's a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just one or the other. So you're going to talk and you're going to see your, your orthopedic doctors, your pulmonary doctors, GIs, rehab, genetics, acute care, you know, you know, and primary medications and pharmacy, you know, you have your pharmacists and your medicines and those sort of things. And we all have heard this before that new treatments will continue to evolve and we're in a space now that is continually changing and Therapists, unfortunately, we don't have all the answers either. So we may tell you we don't know because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how your child or your the patient is going to react. And but it's our job to do the best we can to get you to where you want to go, and that's going to to continue to change and evolve over time. And then this just is the reference to it was the care considerations were actually printed in two parts of. Part one is up there because that's where the, the PT section was in, but there is also a part two that covers the other topics that aren't listed in part one. Are there any questions? Anybody have questions for Matt? All right. On my way. You should be able to hear much better now. Hi. Hi. Um, so one of the things we've um, we've been a little confused um, about how to handle since Aiden's received the gene therapy is knowing how much um, to push him because that's been that's what's changed a lot. Um, so typically we were just doing the same exercises kind of over and over again and just hoping he could keep doing them for as long as possible. Um, and when he stopped doing them, it'd be an indicator that he'd lost strength. But now, kind of. What both we and the physio are struggling with is how to set goals and get him to work towards them and making sure those goals are not too aggressive, but also knowing that we're pushing him now that he has the ability um, to, to move a bit more than he used to. Correct. Um, so that's, um, I think, a point all of us are, are struggling with is what, and so we're, I think the, the most important part is from a therapy perspective is knowing not only you know the individual child but also there are guidelines set out there by the American Academy of Sports Medicine that are talk about exercise and say you know you should do this many sets of this many reps until you get to do that and then you can go to the next one based so there are and you have to kind of the hard part is those are set out for you know people not affected with SMA um, so, but adapting those guidelines or those molds and saying, you know, all right, so maybe he needs to do three reps now and he does three and then maybe he does them consistently well and in good form 
for so many visits and then the next time okay maybe we go to five and then he stay there until you get to the next one and because i think the hard part is from a therapy perspective is if you change them too soon you want them to have good form and to be able to maintain it for a certain period so typically i would i recommend two weeks or so like if you can do the same thing for two weeks and you do them very well through the whole time then you're probably ready to go to the next thing but it, it's not kind of again these are guidelines it's not set in you know you have to do it that way but that tends to work pretty well anybody else all right thank you matt you're welcome